Good morning, everyone. Um, let's just open in prayer and then we'll go into class today. Would someone be willing to pray for us? To give us your spirit of understanding, to give us your spirit of revelation, or Lord Father, give us your wisdom and help us to understand, help us to also remember, O Lord Father, and also, O Lord, uh, help us, O Lord Father, how to implement them in our lives, Jesus. And Lord, we ask you, O Lord Father, to help us uh, not to get distracted, but help us, O Lord Father, to be in one accord, O Lord Father, to watch your teaching us and help us to focus, O Lord Father. We just submit everything into your hands. We submit Smith and Ann to your hands, O Lord Father. And you speak to us, O Lord Father, and you teach us with your spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Um, so, yeah, I, I think the due date for your um, reflection paper was last week. Uh, if you all have not yet submitted it. Um, for the, your reflection paper, the personal reflection was uh, Saturday. So, um, if you have not yet submitted it, please make sure to submit the paper. Um, and then with your final paper, if you'll have any questions. Um, so one question was about the original originality check. That is just to benefit you, uh, to help you kind of check. Uh, because one of the things I'm grading on is to make sure that you've done uh, the work yourself you've not just copied from a website and pasted it and uh, are submitting that so the original uh, originality check will uh, check your sources and if uh, your content is just copied and pasted it will highlight whatever has whatever is from an outside source um, so if you were not able to check it it's fine it's for your benefit uh, to be able to check it but it's not required. Um, you you know if your work was original, so that's all. Uh, if you are using outside sources, then you just have to uh, mention the at the end of the paper mention um, the sources that you used. Just make a list of sources used. Yeah, I think for your next paper, I've given you all that. Did I give you all that option? Um, no, I okay. I don't think this one. Okay. <clears throat> no, you don't really need to reference any outside sources even for this one. But if you do, then that's the way to do it to mention that you've used another source. Um, so yeah, let's go. Um, I just wanted to uh, let you all know. So we've caught up with whatever where we should be in our uh, schedule and so i won't need to post an extra video for us to catch up on anything uh, so i won't there won't be any video for you all to watch we'll just try and keep up with the content in class itself uh, the final paper okay how to do it okay so uh, your final paper uh, basically chapter 8 kind of gives a summary of what happens in a revival what are the things uh, that are seen um, what is the heart of the person who uh, like if they want to be used in a revival what kind of heart do they have how have they been spiritually uh, prepared to be used by god uh, so i wanted just a summary of all those it's all in points uh, so i just need the main points you don't need to explain the points too much uh, or anything just the main points and then look at another revival look at either the revival you presented on 
or uh, a revival that we looked at last week, that chapter five, I think I mentioned, right? Yeah, chapter five has more details on a few revivals. So you can take one of those revivals or a re the revival you presented on and look at those points that are mentioned in chapter eight and kind of compare and see what were some of those things that chapter eight talks about that were seen in this revival. Uh, that's basically it. Yeah, so say for example, okay, let me just open chapter eight. Uh, good. Okay, so okay, so uh, chapter eight talks about uh, pursuing God. Uh, so when people pursue God, uh, they uh, that is one of the ways through which revival is sparked. Or um, okay, and then there's just like different verses. Your heart condition, so a heart that is humble. Um, a heart that is hungry, uh, heart that is passionate and persistent. So some of the things that it's talking about in order uh, for you to prepare yourself to be used in uh, or to be a carrier of revival. And so if we look at these main points and then you look at, um, say you're looking at John Wesley, uh, did you see in your, as you were presenting on John Wesley, is there something that revealed that he had that kind of heart of humility, a heart that was passionate? Uh, was he pursuing God personally? Um, all of those things. So to talk about that, um, or if you're looking at one of the ones from um, chapter five, so the layman's prayer revival, we see that people started to seek God and there was regular prayer happening. So they were pursuing God in that way. Um, so to just take these points and then look at it in whichever revival you are uh, looking at. Yeah, so you can, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you can you can either do John Wesley or look at one of the revivals from Chapter Five. Yeah, just the main points. Everything is in. It's all highlighted in bold uh, that chapter. So just those main uh, bold points. You can decide how detailed you want to get. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. I haven't given a word limit. You, you, it doesn't have to be long, um, but you can decide depending on how much you feel you need to say. For one question, is it? Um, it may be. The minimum, I would say, is more important that you cover all the main points. So make sure that you've mentioned all the main points from chapter eight. That is important. And then that you've uh, answered the question fully. So you, you've also looked at that revival and kind of highlighted which points were seen in that revival. So. So yeah, for this paper, I'm more interested in you answering the question thoroughly. So I didn't give a word limit because some people may, depending on how much detail you give, it may be longer. But uh, the length of the paper is not important, just that you've answered the question Yeah. Uh, any questions from those online? on the assignments. OK, we'll um, go into today's content. So we're starting uh, with chapter 6 in your textbook. Uh, 
which is the restoration of the church. I just have some of the main points shared on the PowerPoint, not too much detail, but... So, um, if someone can read for us Lamentations 5.21, we'll be looking at a few scriptures today, so I'll just ask you all to open and read uh, so Lamentations 5.21. Lamentations 5, verse 21. Turn us back to you, O Lord, and we will be restored. Renew our days as of old. Okay, so this is uh, uh, just a verse to talk about uh, this, this aspect of restoration uh, within the church. So turning back to the Lord. Uh, turning back to truths that have been forgotten, uh, and then seeing renewal uh, that is reflective of what was once in the uh, in God's presence. Uh, now we are taking this specifically within the church. So why we looked at the Book of Acts was that's where we saw. Um, the Holy Spirit coming in power, and we saw what God did in that time, and that is the kind of restoration we want to uh, to see the Holy Spirit moving that way in the church, uh, and to see renewal within the church at present, so that we are more reflective of that church in the Book of Acts. Um, so usually this process uh, starts with Reformation. Reformation is a returning to truth. Um, so when we look at the reformers um, that that actually played a big role in the church, uh, whether it's Martin Luther or uh, it is Calvin, it was a restoration to scriptural truth, right? So they started to preach about uh, things that were in the Bible that were not being followed in the church. And so they were calling the church back to scriptural truth. Uh, so uh, Reformation is that, that restoration to truth. Uh, and when we see um, truth being restored within the church, then uh, there is transformation that happens within the church. And the church becomes a place that is prepared for God to move. So uh, we talk about new wineskin. So uh, being people who are prepared and ready uh, for the new wine that God wants to pour out, uh, and then pour out through the church into the world as well. Um, and then through that restoration to the new wineskin, uh, we are also restored in our pursuit of God, that we start to seek after God in a new, with a new zeal, a new passion, uh, to see God move in our midst, for God to have uh, more of a powerful presence and impact in the church and through the church. And then the last is to see the church impacting the world. Okay, so uh, we see God uh, moving powerfully within the church, and then the church then goes out and impacts the world. So those are the four steps in revival that we're looking at. First is returning to the truth, so that's the reformation. Uh, the second is being made a new wineskin, prepared for that wine that God wants to pour out, the new thing that God wants to do in our midst, uh, pursuing God in a new way, and then impacting the world. Um, so if someone can open Ephesians 4, 13 and 14. Till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a perfect man, to the measure of the state, uh, stature of the fullness of Christ, that we should no longer be children, tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. Yeah, so we, uh, in Ephesians 4, it's talking about the apostles, the prophets, the teachers, uh, the pastors, uh, being people who equip the saints till we reach this place of maturity in Christ, uh, to a fuller understanding, a fuller reflection of the fullness of Christ. Uh, so this is what we have seen in the church happen as we've looked at these revivals, um, starting with the Reformation. So in the Dark Ages, there was uh, almost like a 
we'd forgotten so much uh, that the church had experienced earlier was forgotten in the Dark Ages. And so in the Reformation, it was a restoring to that previous understanding of who God is, of the, how the Holy Spirit moves. Um, so we have here a list of different things that have been restored to the church since then, um, starting with the Reformation, salvation by grace through faith, right? Rather than salvation through our works, through our um, true acts of uh, whether it is charity or through uh, through acts of penance or whatever different ways in which the church had started to seek forgiveness. Uh, in the Reformation, there was an emphasis on salvation by grace through faith. Uh, that, that is the only way to salvation. Um, another thing that was restored is water baptism. So um, if we look back at the at the early church, that is the church in Acts, um, there were children being baptized because whole households were coming to faith in Christ. <laughs> but, um, but this continued to be practiced in the church. Um, but the problem was that people were being baptized into the faith as children, but were not continuing in the church, were not continuing in faith. So uh, the understanding of what baptism is was lost, that it is something that we do uh, when we ourselves believe. Um, and so this water baptism for the believer was restored to the church as something that when you are mature enough to uh, receive Christ as your savior, and you are coming to this decision that you want to follow Christ, then you get baptized. So then you become a part of the church. You can't be um, a part of the church or you can't take baptism without having that experience or understanding. Uh, so that is one thing. Then another was sanctification and holy living. So uh, we see through the holiness movement, um, that there was a restoration of understanding of uh, the importance of holiness of heart and holiness of life uh, as believers, that um, it's not only about following rules, not only about legalistic uh, teaching from scripture, it is about a life that is transformed. Um, understanding and welcoming the work and ministry of the spirit so this we see uh, post the holiness movement where uh, there were they started to be through the great awakenings the holy spirit uh, more uh, evidence of the holy spirit at work um, initially mostly with people coming to the Lord. So people being saved, uh, people repenting of their sins, people within the church as well coming to that uh, point of salvation. And then we see baptism, the Holy Spirit, gifts of the Holy Spirit uh, uh, as a gradual move from this place of conviction. We then start to see uh, more of these kinds of signs within the church when the Holy Spirit was moving. Um, then growing in the knowledge of God's word, uh, talking about victorious Christian living. So uh, a lot more teaching on that has been restored to the church. Uh, the role and function of the fivefold offices, we look at that more in detail, but the apostle, the prophet, the teacher, the pastor uh, being the offices that were restored to the church. Um, and then the equipping of saints. So recognizing that every believer is a minister. And uh, so that division between um, the, the leaders in the church or the ministers in the church and the actual lay people within the church has been broken down a lot compared to what it was um, hundreds of years ago. So starting with the Reformation, where there was a huge divide between the uh, clergy and the laity. So um, that is uh, the first point. And the second is restoration in wineskin. So uh, this is where the church itself is prepared to receive the new move uh, that God wants to pour out. So can someone read Matthew 9, 17 for us? Nor do they put new wine into old wineskins, or else the wineskins break. 
the wine is spilled and the wineskins are ruined, but they put new wine into new wineskins and both are preserved. Okay, so uh, again, we're, when we're referring to wineskin, it's just uh, the, the container into which the wine is poured and the container from which uh, wine is poured out. Right, so uh, this talks about outward things that may that have changed in the church, the way worship is done, uh, the way structures within the church uh, have been uh, set up, or the way the hierarchy within the leadership is set up. All of those things are things that have changed through these revivals, through these reformations. And uh, the point of changing those things is to enable. Uh, the move of God in that. So to be better carriers of God's move. Um, so a few of these things are uh, church governance, church structure, and the methods that were used. Right? We see uh, before there was a lot of liturgy in use in the church. Now um, a lot of churches, especially in the charismatic movement or uh, in the Pentecostal movement, there's less use of liturgy. There's much more... Uh, much more of just how is the Holy Spirit leading and uh, much more of free worship in the services. Um, church governance, whereas uh, especially in the Dark Ages, there was uh, more established, uh, the Pope, the priests, all of those things, all of that has been broken down over the last hundreds of years. Um, and then methods that were used um, in terms of how preaching was done, a lot more uh, open field preaching. Uh, there were times, uh, like during John Wesley's time, uh, it was considered shameful to preach in an open field. Uh, you had to preach within a church. So all of these things, methods changing uh, so that God could move, God could do what he wanted to do through the church. <coughs> Okay, uh, restoration of the fivefold offices. Um, so we have a long list of uh, different people who have kind of taken their place in this um, in this restoration. So uh, we see in Ephesians four eleven and twelve. Someone can just read that for us. <coughs> Ephesians 4, 11 and 12. And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Yes, so uh, these fivefold offices were... Uh, some things that we didn't uh, see at all after the early church, after Acts and um, a few centuries after that, uh, a lot of those roles, especially with the apostles, um, uh, the prophets, uh, those roles were kind of lost in the church. Uh, so starting with the 1950s, there was a gradual restoration of these fivefold offices, uh, with the understanding that those people in those positions are there to equip the believers so that believers can be ministers. So it's not that these people have these positions and they are going to be the ones who minister. It's that they are going to equip believers to be ministers. Uh, so in the 1950s, the evangelists so We'll just look quickly through that list. There's Catherine Kalman, William Branham, A. Allen, Lester Sumrall, uh, Jack Coe, Oral Roberts, Billy Graham, Franz Hunter, T.L. and Daisy Osborne, D.G.S. Dinakaran, uh, Reynard Bonke, Benny Hinn, Randy Clark. So these are just a few examples. This is not to say that this list is... Uh, a complete list and there are no others. Uh, it's just a few people who were part uh, of this move of restoration of evangelists who started to take the gospel out uh, and do these huge gospel meetings where uh, not only were they preaching the gospel, but they were also seeing uh, signs, wonders, miracles accompanying that preaching of the gospel. Um, 
let me see the restoration of the pastor and teacher. Uh, this happened uh, in the 1960s and 70s. Uh, so a few examples are Kenneth Hagin Sr., Derek Prince, Bill Johnson. Um, then we see the prophet being restored around the 1980s. Again, uh, Kenneth Hagin Sr., uh, Bill Hammond, and then DGS Dinakran. Uh, as people who kind of uh, filled that prophet role. Um, in the 1990s, we saw apostles uh, being raised up. So Bill Hammond, Bill Johnson, Randy Clark uh, are a few examples. Now, uh, when we talk about apostles, um, it's different from the first 12, the founding apostles uh, of the church or the 12 apostles that followed Christ. But it's people who uh, function in very pioneering roles within the church, uh, taking the church to new levels of uh, understanding of who God is um, and uh, growing the church to those in those new understandings. Um, so some of the other things uh, we've seen uh, in this time is that there's greater unity uh, across denominational lines. So even though um, there were churches that didn't believe in the Holy Spirit, uh, in the move of the Holy Spirit in our present day, we see in revivals that those very people experienced uh, the Holy Spirit in their midst, and they couldn't deny uh, then that it was the Holy Spirit moving because they saw lives transformed, they saw people coming to Christ. Uh, so revivals cross denominational lines, which is a, a really powerful thing. It brings greater unity to uh, the body of Christ across denominations as well. Uh, and we more fully reach this in John 17, 21. It says that they may all be one, uh, as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. Uh, so that is the goal in that unity of the body of Christ, uh, that it is a witness to the world of who Christ is. Um, so uh, some of the movements that uh, made an impact in the church being that wineskin through which God was uh, able to move and pour out new wine uh, is um, there's, there's just a list here we'll go through. So 1900, the Pentecostal movement. Um, here uh, we see the baptism of the Holy Spirit and um, praying in tongues as two of the big things that happened through the Pentecostal movement. And some of the churches that were birthed through that is the Assemblies of God, the Church of God. In 1940, there was the Latter Rain movement. Uh, and this uh, is where they talked about the fivefold offices being restored and that all believers could manifest the gifts of the Spirit. So uh, we saw that in this latter rain movement that started in Canada. Uh, 1970 to 1990 was the Word of Faith movement. Um, so this was where uh, people started to declare the Word and believe God uh, would fulfill His Word, whether it came in the form of healing, or in the form of uh, faith, uh, just faith, uh, using faith to uh, speak the word and believe that God would fulfill that uh, establishing of our identity in Christ, uh, understanding what it means to walk in prosperity uh, in accordance with God's word, right? So that uh, God desires prosperity for his people. Um, 1960 to 1970 was the charismatic movement. So uh, whereas in the Pentecostal movement, there was baptism of the Holy Spirit and tongues, the charismatic movement saw more of the other gifts of the Spirit starting to be um, experienced, starting to be expressed within the church. 1970 to 1980 was the Jesus movement. Um, here, there was a much greater emphasis on encountering Christ personally. Uh, so there was a lot less uh, concern about 
how people came to church or people the kinds of people who were coming to church it was much more about people personally encountering christ and experiencing the transformation of the holy spirit um 1970 to even the present day there's a change in the way worship was done um we talked about this earlier also with the hippie uh movement right so that that had a huge impact on how worship was done within the church. So some of the uh, bands that came in at that time were the Maranatha, Singers, Integrity, Vineyard, Hillsong, Jesus Culture. Um, so that really moved from um, a very formal way of worship to uh, worship that is heartfelt, uh, worship that comes from people's experiences, worship that uh, expects for God to move through those songs, uh, for the Holy Spirit to move through those songs. So um, yeah, it has impacted worship to the present day church. 1980 to 2000 was the third wave movement um, where there was much more uh, power evangelism that was seen, uh, that is where signs, wonders, miracles were accompanying evangelism. Um, so one of uh, the leaders uh, who was used powerfully at this time is John Wimber, uh, who was used within the Vineyard Church. Um, so a lot of seeing healing, seeing miracles, along with uh, taking the gospel to the lost. 1980, um, all, even to present day, a lot of prayer and intercession and emphasis on prayer and intercession. Um, so uh, people who have been key people in this is Reese Howells um, and his son Samuel Howells. Then we uh, looked at David Yonggi Cho from um, the Yoida Full Gospel Church in Seoul. Uh, the, so their church started this prayer mountain. So they had a uh, night and day prayer. Uh, they started that in 1973. Um, then there's Larry Lee, who started the International Prayer Movement. Then there's the International House of Prayer in Kansas. I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with this, but uh, you, I hope, uh, right? Yeah, so they have 24-7 praise and worship, uh, and that's been happening since... Uh, September 19, 1999 to present day, 24-7 uh, prayer and worship in um, in their buildings. Um, and then Dutch Sheets and Lou Engel are some uh, present day prayer leaders. Uh, so we have a quote here from Reese Howells. It said, the world became our parish and we were led to be responsible to intercede for countries and nations. Um, so the idea here being 24-7 prayer and intercession for the world. Um, the church growth movement, this is something we also talked about, how we're seeing um, mega churches coming into existence. And uh, one of the examples was uh, David Yonggi Cho's and um, their church. Uh, they primarily used the cell group movement, uh, so starting of cell groups and equipping of uh, believers for ministry. So that was um, something that made a huge impact on their church. And then there have been other ways that other churches have used other innovative methods uh, for their church to grow using media um, and uh, using much more... Um, much larger buildings uh, using other methods to draw people in uh, to the church. Um, 2000 uh, to present the saints movement uh, that is um, again releasing people into uh, whatever God has called them to um, equipping them and releasing them into that. Uh, some examples of people who have been part of this movement is Francis McNutt, uh, Bishop Bill Hammond, John Wimber, John and Carol Arnett of Vineyard, Randy Clark, Bill Johnson. And then the last is the Marketplace Ministry Movement, which is uh, 
that whole movement which uh, talks about impacting the seven mountains of society so family religion education media arts uh, entertainment business government so looking at how is the church impacting all of these areas impacting the world and uh, much more focus on equipping every believer so that when they go into the marketplace they are able to impact their spaces uh, with the kingdom of god uh, so these are some of the ways in which the church we've seen um, the church transform the church's focus transformed so that uh, god can move in the way he wants to move in present day uh, and why this is important is for us to be sensitive to what is god doing in our day uh, what does he want to do in the present day church and how do we need to change the way we are doing things to allow god to move uh, so whether it is changing the way our leadership runs uh, whether it's changing the way our church meets right so the cell group movement uh, the focus is on discipleship the focus is on these small groups rather than the uh, big church gatherings uh, so recognizing what is it that god wants to do in our day in our context and how do we change our structures how do we change our functioning to allow that to happen uh, that's the importance of this new wineskin um, concept um okay so restoration in us pursuing god's purposes can someone read uh, ephesians 4 11 and 12 Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11 and 12. And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry, for the defying of the body of Christ. Okay, so um, here, uh, what we talked about earlier, that every believer should be equipped. Uh, every believer is responsible for the ministry of the church and so while we have these positions of the apostle the prophet the teacher the pastor um it is for the sake of every believer being equipped uh and it's not for the sake of those positions um and then the last we see is the restoration of the church's impact on the world uh, someone can read matthew 5 13 to 16. Matthew 5, verse 13 to 16. You are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled under, underfoot by men. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket but on a lampstand and it gives light to all those who are in the house let your light shine so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your father in heaven amen so uh here we see uh what we talked about that not only is the church transformed but then the church is used by god to impact the world uh so we see in this passage that uh, the church is called to be salt and light. Uh, we're called to be the people who are displaying God's glory. And by that, uh, people turn to Christ just by seeing the glory of God in the church. Um, and so this is uh, what has been restored to the church and understanding that we are to impact the world. We're not here to uh, just be a separate body of people who are uh, cut off from the rest of the world. We do our thing and the world does its own thing. Uh, we meet on a Sunday, we worship in the church. We, uh, our faith is not contained to that Sunday service or to uh, the gathering of believers, but it is to be taken out to the spaces that we are in, right? To, the, to our everyday places, to our workplaces, to our homes, uh, to our neighborhoods, uh, in all those places that the kingdom of God is in us and is impacting the places we are in um, 
And so that is another big restoration that has happened within the understanding of what is the church's role and what, uh, how do we live that out in our contexts. Uh, so we'll close with that. And tomorrow we'll look at chapter 7, um, which is revival in our day. Thank you all.